what we're looking at right now is the third day of the festival of Sukkot. Now, day one and day two have Haft Torah readings that go along with the, the, the Torah portion. For this, for today, there was only really three verses that one is supposed to be meditating upon, and those are Numbers 19, 17 to, 20, uh, to 17 to 19. And so this really deals with all the animals that are actually being offered. And so that's what you're actually looking at with, the, with those verses. So I wanted to go back and I wanted to go to the first day of Sukkot. And uh, Sukkot's special to me because I had the opportunity to go to Israel during the season. Had the opportunity to watch the, the march of the, of the assembly through the streets on the first day of Sukkot the flag day and i also got a chance to go up to jerusalem on the last day of sukkot and on the last day of sukkot we went to a, a synagogue uh, a large one and i cannot remember the name for the life of me but anyway went to a large one and besides the the jewish people who attend the synagogue there was our group of larry tony glenda and i and a mormon class came to see what happened on Sukkot. So they brought their books with them and I can still remember them walking around with their books, getting ready to write when a, the Jewish men walked up to them, put their books down on the side and pulled them out onto the floor. And so they began to dance. So I don't know what kind of notes they took that night, but they were having a great time getting involved in, in what, what was going on. So Sukkot is a special festival, and it's going to be a special festival for all of us eventually. But the half Torah reading then comes from Zechariah. Now, it's actually the, the whole story is in chapters 12, 13, and 14. So all three of those chapters together give you a better rounded picture of all that's going to take place at the Battle of Gog and Magog. Now, understand that Zechariah, when he wrote this, they were still building the second temple. He was there when Nehemiah was building the wall around the outside of the city. So Zechariah is not any closer to the temple period that we're going to be talking about. He's thousands of years away. And so when you look at his writings and when you look at what he's beginning to say, you're going to have to come to the understanding that much of what he's talking about is far future. And many of the rabbis will tell you that they really won't be able to understand everything that's there. And the reason they won't be able to understand everything that's there, because it's, it's almost coded 3,000 years into the future. Now, we're talking about a war, a final war. Now, we know in the New Testament, they have the Battle of Armageddon. The one problem with the Battle of Armageddon is Armageddon, Arma, Arm, is a mountain. Megiddo was on a mountain. It wasn't a valley. The valley was below. But Armageddon comes to, from the idea of Har, which is a mountain, Megiddo, the city. That was the northern city by which Solomon established a uh, tax port. Anybody bringing their goods through the country of Israel paid a, a tax. It's a tollway into the nation. Also at the other end where I was at, down at, at uh, Tel Tamar, was a second taxway. So in other words, people coming in from the south paid taxes as they moved in through the country. And so taxes were collected at both ends of the country. But our battle is not going to take place, as I'm understanding it, at either of those places. Now, if we go through the, the whole story, Gog and Magog was established that this event, what we're reading about, actually is going to happen during the time of Sukkot. Now, that comes from the Code of Jewish Law, the Shulchan Aruch Harav. And understand this from from this little limited under little bit of history that i'm giving you there this is a what we're going to look at is the final phase of the battle of gog and magog and we call it a battle when in actuality what we're really talking about is a war 
You see, the war will end at Jerusalem. It doesn't begin at Jerusalem. It ends at Jerusalem. And we also have to understand that Gog and Magog is also written in the book of Ezekiel, chapters 38 and 39, where Gog is, is literally laid out for us. And so, therefore, we have not one, not two, but we're going to have what I would call three specific wars of Gog and Magog. That's what you're actually looking at is three specific wars. Now, these wars could also take place, or one of them could also take place next week during the week when we not study Bereshit, but the week we study Noah. Because in Noah, we run into the 70 tribes. Now, if you take the numeric value of the word Gog, Vomogog, you have a value of 70. So many rabbis believe that the, that the battle of Gog and Magog will end during the time of Noah. Others say, no, it's going to begin or it's going to be taking place at least in the start during the month or during Sukkot itself. And so we have two different ways of looking at it. Now, Gog is the leader of this group of people. I didn't tell you before, but I, I think I've said it a, a number of times in the past, and I'm sure not everybody's heard it. But my understanding is Rabbi Richmond, several years ago, began to wonder whether President Obama was actually Gog. In fact, he went back into the book of Ezekiel and he found the literation of Obama's name written across the name Gog. Uh, I can go through that later, but I just wanted to give you that information. So Gog is a person. Magog is a place. And so this person is called Gog. Now, Gog is spelled Gimel Vav Gimel. And so if you look at that name, you, you have a, an, an understanding. The letter in the middle is a Vav six it's it's the value that's why they understand that this is the sixth millennia and it's during the sixth millennia that this is going to happen now the two gimels each one of them equals three so you have again three on either side of it it wasn't until the 11th century that hebrew actually got vowels up until then the language was fluid and words could be created having similar understandings. And so the word Gog itself then may not have looked like Gog. It may have looked like Gimel Gimel. Well, Gimel Gimel is another word that's very important. It's the word Gog. Gog. And Gog is the word for roof. So Gog, who is against God, has a roof on his house. In Sukkot, the people sleep in the sukkah, where the roof is thatched, and you can see up into the stars. Gog never wanted to see the stars. Gog makes himself God. So therefore, he never looks to the heavens. He looks to himself. And the battle of Gog and Magog here in 14 is going to leave us to the point where we understand that all of the things that are going to happen to him are because he cannot look up. He cannot see what's going on. Do you remember the character Nebuchadnezzar when he found himself in a situation where he spoke against God and found himself out in the midst of the, of the pasture eating grass like any other common animal? It wasn't until he looked up that he was again regained his understanding and he began to praise God. Gog will never look up. Gog will never look into the sky to see the heavens, to understand God is up there. He is God. He comes against Jerusalem and Israel in particular because that's the home of the one God that he can't seem to replace. Because you can look around the world and we can find in the world that God has various names and various meanings. In fact, most of them have no value whatsoever. But the Jewish understanding of God has value. And it's what 
man has been trying to eliminate ever since Abraham. Remember, Abraham was the very first person after the flood to identify the one true God. He began to create students around himself based on that idea. And so he carried the mantle all the way through to his son Isaac, to his grandson Jacob, to Joseph, as we go on through the lines. So God is attached to the Jewish people. Gog is attached to himself and all of the other religious systems that put God and put him outside the camp. So we begin to look at this whole situation quite differently. Now, as I said before, Gog also appears in Ezekiel 38, Ezekiel 39, and again here in 12, 13, and 14 in the book of Zechariah. Now, most people, when they look at this, is, are going to say that this becomes confusing. There was a man named Hafetzheim. Well, that's not his real name. His real name was Kagan, Rabbi Kagan. Hafetzheim was his pen name. Remember, he wrote the book dealing with the mouth and truth and lies and dealing with all of the things that come from one's mouth. Well, in doing so, he lived in the time, basically, just during the days of World War I. In fact, he dies in, in I think it's 1935. I've got it written down somewhere. But he dies not too soon after World War I is done. And he became the first one to identify Ezekiel 38 with World War I. And he began to write and, and he began to make explanations. Not only did he do that, but he said that 45 years after World War I, we will have World War II. And that will be Gog, Magog, the second war. And he says about 70 years after that, maybe longer, we will have a third and final war. And that's the war that we're looking at tonight. That's the war of the final war where Gog is put away. And we begin to move towards righteousness. That's what's going to happen at this particular point in time. Now, Jerusalem is the focus of this, right? Because that's where the, these three chapters deal with. Not the fact that it, they have marched through Israel and through other nations to get to Jerusalem, but Jerusalem was their target. That's where they were going. Now, Jerusalem is not a city that's, that has not seen war. We know it was destroyed at least twice. And according to other things that I've read, it, it was besieged 23 times, attacked 25 times, captured 44 times by various armies. So, Jerusalem has known war all along. It's nothing that's going to be new to them. And Daniel will tell us in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, there will be a trouble such as had never been since there was a nation unto this time. And the nation he's talking about is Jerusalem. That's the nation. Now, as we go through the story, in fact, let's do that. I want you to get your Bible, and we're going to walk through the scriptures and that way i can kind of shorten our time so we're in daniel or daniel we're in jeremiah <laughs> we're in zechariah chapter 14 verse 1 okay behold a day is coming for hashem when your spoils will be divided up in your midst now the day is coming when your spoils will be divided up Remember that when armies passed through an area, oftentimes their salary was not based on somebody giving them so many coins for having fought. Their salary will come from what they take, the spoils that they grab from the houses, whatever they gather up, whatever rape and pillage, whatever they want to do, that's fine. That's their salary. Now, according to this, then, when your spoils will be divided, Israel's spoils will be divided amongst the nations that are coming down. And understand, Gog and Magog may be referring to 70 nations coming down. In other words, the world will be coming after Jerusalem. That is the way it's to be understood. 
I will gather all, no exceptions. Notice that. I will gather all nations to Jerusalem for the war. And the city will be captured. The houses will be pillaged. And the women will be violated. Note, half the city will go out into exile. Now, this is a final war. It's not just simply a battle. If you, if you remember the, the second temple destruction, the city was under siege for months. Once they breached the wall was not the end of the battle. The battle continued for months more because you see fighting went from street to street. The same thing will happen when they breach the walls of Jerusalem and there are no walls. So as you watch what's going on, you're going to see that they will be going house to house, hand to hand combat. That will be going on because the Jewish people will defend their city and they will defend their property. But even in the defense, notice that there's going to be a great deal of loss. In fact, the loss will be so great <clears throat> that the houses will be pillaged, the women violated, half the city will go out into exile. Not all the city, only half. Now, does that mean half of the men will die? Is that what the other half is? Or does that mean that the battle will not end with the entire city being captured? That's one of the questions that Rashi asks. Now, as you continue through the stories in the next verse, it goes on to say, Hashem will go out and wage war with those nations as he waged war on the day of battle. Now, he doesn't tell us what the day of battle is. So we're going to have to presuppose and understand what the rabbis were thinking this is referring to. They understood that this battle that he's talking about is the battle at the Sea of Reeds between the Jewish people and Pharaoh's army. That's the battle that they were talking about. So in other words, God is going to, again, just as he did at the Sea of Reeds, defending the Jewish people, he will go back and do the same thing here. So Gog and Pharaoh are a match. If we wanted to understand what Gog looked and acted like, we should go to Pharaoh. That will be our best example. Now he goes on to say in this particular thing, his feet will stand on that day on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives will split open at its middle, east to west, forming a very wide valley. Half the mountain will move to the north and half the mountain will move to the south. There's a lot to unpack in that verse. And let's go back to the beginning of it. His feet. Now, if you're reading a Christian version, you will find that the feet that are spoken of here will be J.C.'s feet. He's the one who lands on the mountain and splits it. But feet, again, are metaphorical. God has no feet. God has no hands. God has no wrath. God has, God is. And so when we look at this idea of feet, what we're really looking at is a metaphor. It is be as though God will land on the Mount of Olives. And when he does, the mountains will split. Now, if, if you've looked at a map of Jerusalem and you've seen the Mount of Olives, you, I have to put it in this form. If you go to the, to the right or, or towards the uh, south, that is all tombs. That's, that's the burial sites of the Jewish people. Now, if you go to the north, you will find that that's where the churches have built. That's where they have annexed that land. That, that is all, quote, Christian area. Also, there will be some mosques in that area. So he's going to land and split this land mass apart. I have to imagine that he's going to land at that very point, separating the Jewish graves from the rest of the, of the mountains. And that's going to be a rift that's going to go through there. Now, as he goes through this, he says that it will split open east to east, forming a very wide valley. Half the mountain will move to the north, half will move to the south. 
So he creates this valley. Now, as we read in the next verses, it says, and you will flee to the valley of the mountains for the valley of the mountains will reach to Azal. So the mountains are going to split and you're going to be running towards the Jordanian or towards the valley of the Jordan Valley. Azal has been identified. It is approximately the location where Zedekiah was captured by, by Nebuchadnezzar's men. It's a specific place. It's next to a wadi. The wadi has been identified. Everything seems to be in place. And it seems to be the most direct route between Jerusalem itself. And if you'd use the eastern gate, you'd go straight out the gate and across the valley, out through the, the break, the, the riff, and you would end up on the other side. Now, in terms of God splitting the mountain by standing on it, I want you to understand that, that Jerusalem and cities all the way along sit on what's called the Rift Valley. I don't know if you've heard of the Rift Valley. The Rift Valley goes all the way from Tanzania all the way up through until Turkey. Now, you hear about the earthquakes in Turkey. You don't hear much about earthquakes in, in Israel. But all the way along, that is the valley. That is the largest, longest fault line in the world. It sits at the Rift Plate. It sits on the African Plate. It sits on the Asian Plate. It's a long, long valley. And it's going to be the site of where this earthquake is going to happen. Now, Gog would have just simply say that they had an earthquake. The rest of the people are going to say the very same thing because it will be terrorizing. I've not really been in a, an earthquake. I've seen videos of people who have suffered through it. I know that the earthquake disorients everybody in the midst of it. And so there will be a great deal of disorientation. Now, as you go through this, this text, again, we have this problem. The problem is how do we interpret what it is that's actually being said? Now, Rashi and others have noticed that they will flee, and the word for flee here is ne or ve na stem, to or through the valley. But the Targum looks at that same word and again changed the vowels because, again, when Zechariah wrote this, there were no vowels. Change the vowels and it becomes ve nestam which means, and the valley between the mountains shall be closed up. So not only is the valley going to open, but the valley will close. Now, there's no time given as to how long this, this rift will open. But it also tells you that there's going to be other seismic waves, that there's going to be a long series of events. And so whether it's a day, an hour, even a week, the idea is that there's going to be a sudden change and a shift along that valley. Now, as it goes on from there into verse number five, it says, and you will flee to the valley of the mountains and the valley of the mountains will reach to Azal. And you will flee as you fled from the earthquake that was in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Well, King Uzziah, remember, if you go back to the stories, Uzziah decided that he wanted to put an offering. He wanted to offer the incense on the altar of incense. He's the king. He's not the Kohen. He had no re right to even think he could do it, but he snuck into the temple and he began to put that those ashes onto the altar of incense. Now, the Kohen and the, the Levites that were in there told him not to, but he went ahead and did it. And at the moment he put the ashes in there, he became Tsaritz, leper. Now, remember, at that point in time, a leper is dead. And Uzziah will spend the remaining part of his life in a cemetery because he's dead. Not really dead but he's dead as far as everyone can see him. He is a leper. Understand then 
that the, the moment that he put that ashes on there, a great earthquake happened at that very moment. He became touched and the earth became touched. Now, if you go to Isaiah chapter six, you're going to find, why don't you do that? Turn to Isaiah chapter six. If you have a Bible like mine, chapter six begins on page, uh, I have an art scroll, by the way. Chapter six begins on page 963. 963. Now, in this particular part of, of 963, it's in the year that King Uzziah's death. Now, remember, King Uzziah didn't die. He became a leper. I saw the Lord sitting upon a high and lofty throne, and his legs filled the temple. Now, in the other versions, it's not his legs filled the temple, but his train filled the temple. So why why the difference, or what what can we understand? Well, obviously, God is big. If it's only his train that fills the temple, the understanding of the rabbis is he's leaving. In other words, Uzziah's event changed God's location. He left at that point. And that's when we see that the character watching him is Isaiah. He looks and sees what's happening. That's his understanding of what's going on. Because Uzziah or Isaiah was in the tribe of Aaron. So he could see everything up close. So we understand then, back to our story, just like in the days of Uzziah, this earthquake will be massive. Now, it may or may not have been triggered by, it, by the actions of Gog, but at the same point in time, he's giving us a comparison. He goes on to say in the next verse, um, Let's see. And Hashem, my God, will come and all his holy ones with him or with you. And it will be on that day. On what day? On that day when this happens, when this earthquake occurs, the light will not be either very bright or very dim. Why won't it be very bright and why won't it be very dim? The amount of dust and particulate in the air. When an earthquake happens, buildings collapse, fires are started. So there will be light in the city, but it won't be natural light caused by something that somebody turned on an electrical socket. It'll be a situation where the city itself is under siege and there will be a lot of de destruction happening at that very time. Notice it says it will be a unique day. It will be known as Hashem's day so there's already an understanding that when this earthquake happens this day will be very very different from any of the other days neither day or night but it will happen towards evening time there will be light and it shall be on that day spring water will flow out of jerusalem half of it will flow to the eastern sea and half to the western sea okay the spring that we're talking about, first off, if this event occurs in Sukkot, Sukkot's the water time. The last day of the Feast of Sukkot, while I was in Israel, the final actions of the, of the Jewish people are to pray for the coming rains. You see, this is the rainy season. Sukkot begins what we would call fall, but in actuality, that's their spring rains. That's when it rains there. So they look for this time to be a time of rains. So in that particular point, something else is happening. It's not from the sky that they're noticing something happening, but it's from the ground. The water is seeping across. Now, if we go to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 45, we find that from the temple itself, the holy temple, the third temple, there will become a stream of water also. 
and it will flow out the very same way out into the valley and across the valley. Now, at this particular point in time, that water will actually touch the de Dead Sea and cause it to become a living sea. In this case, he's talking about water flowing at such a rate that it will flow to the Eastern Sea. And the Eastern Sea is basically going to be the Dead Sea and Kinneret or the Sea of Galilee. The Western Sea is the Mediterranean. So there's going to be a flow of water that somehow is going to split and go not only north, south, it'll also go east and west. In other words, the lands will begin to change. Everything will start to change. We look at it as a, a climactic event. This will be what Gore and all the rest of them are talking about. This will be the change in the, in the climate. This is what's going to trigger it. Now, as he goes on, he says, this is in the summer and in the winter. So we now know that this, is, this water is just going to be continually flowing. If it happens in the fall, he mentions summer. So in other words, it's a year round event that he's talking about. Hashem will be one, echad. That's the word, echad, singular. There won't be three in one, there'll be one, and that will be God. The entire land will change. Do you see that? This earthquake is going to change the topography of this whole region. The entire land will change to a plain. In other words, all the hills and valleys and all those things will disappear. Can you imagine the seismic event that will be involved in creating such a thing? Imagine all the mountains not being moved, but being, laughed, but being flattened. Now, it'll happen from Gibba to Ramon, south of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem will become lofty, and it will be settled in its place. And from the gate of Benjamin to the place of the first gate at the corner gate, and from the tower of Hananel up to the king's winery, people will live in it, and there will be no more devastation. So in other words, the climax of this whole thing is when it's all said and done, people will live in this new area that's been created. The devastation will happen no more. This is it. This is the end of all of that. And Jerusalem will be settled in security. Now, he goes back into the story again, and he talks about a plague. So the plague doesn't happen after everything's flattened. The plague is going to happen during the events that are happening. This will be the plague with which Hashem will strike all the peoples that have organized against Jerusalem. So remember, he came down earlier with his men and set up a perimeter of defense. That perimeter would be something like what happened with Elisha when uh, the uh, Amorites surrounded them. And his uh, assistant couldn't figure out how are we going to get out of this. And he says, more with us than are with them. And so he allowed him to see with the angels that were there. But notice, this will be a plague with which Hashem will strike all the peoples that have organized against Jerusalem. Each one's flesh will melt away while he is standing on his feet. Each one's eyes will melt away in their sockets, and each one's tongue will melt away in their mouths. Now, if you watch Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know that happens when they open up the lid to the ark. But I, I want you to also understand each one's flesh will melt away. Well, whose flesh? All the peoples who have organized against Jerusalem. That doesn't mean they were standing there at the battle. We're talking about a worldwide event. Imagine the miracles that are going to go on. You see, not everybody is going to be healthy enough to be a part of the army. The Jezebels who are staying at home watching and ironing and all the other good things, they will also be destroyed. This will be a cataclysmic event. That's why the whole world will know about it. They may not understand what's going on, but they will all be a participant. We can look out the window and watch our neighbors melt away, I guess. Now, it goes on to say, 
in verse, um, what is it? Verse number 13. It shall be on that day that there will be a great panic of Hashem among them. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Each one will grab the hand of his fellow and his hands will be raised up against the hand of his fellow. Now, when you grab the neighbor's hand, it's not to sing Kumbaya. What he's talking about is those people will begin to war with one another. The plague will not eventually, will eventually dissolve them. But in the midst of that, there will be a confrontation, not between the Jewish people and God, or Jewish people and, and Gog's people. The confrontation will be between Gog's people. They will be attacking each other. But I want you to notice what happens next. Look at verse 14. Also, Judah will wage war against Jerusalem. Can you imagine? Not all Jews will take the side of God. Not all Jews. There will be some that will work for or work with an underground, if you will. Remember in the United States, back in the days of the revolution, we had the Tories versus the Patriots. Tories helped the, the British. That'll be the same thing that's going on here. Some will choose the side of Gog. They will choose the material side. And the wealth of all nations all around will be gathered. Gold, silver, garments, and great abundance. So the outcome will be, now remember in the beginning, as we were reading verse 1s and 2s, we found that the, the wealth of Israel was going into the hands of, of Gog and his men. Now, as the end comes, we watch the wealth go the other way. And now the wealth becomes a part of the kingdom. Can you remember the battle, the final death knell for Pharaoh, remember, was the 10th plague. What happened after the 10th plague? Israel left with the wealth of, is of Egypt. Now, as they left with the wealth of Egypt, that's what's happening here. Only it won't be just the wealth of Egypt. It'll be the wealth of the world. We'll now move in another direction, move towards them. And similarly will be this plague of the horses, the mules, the camels, the donkeys, the animals that will be in those camps, just like the plague. So here we are in, in Zechariah 14, and we're at, at verse 15. And now we find it's not going to be just the people. It's going to be a plague against even the animals. Again, when Pharaoh's army drowned in the sea, the horses were not spared. Everything drowned. Now he goes on to say, it shall be also who are left over from all the nations who had invaded Jerusalem will come up every year to worship the king Hashem, master, uh, master of legions, and to celebrate the festival of Sukkot. That's, again, another reason why they think this will all happen at Sukkot, is because it will become the annual, just like Hanukkah became the annual uh, days to celebrate the, the, the light that was given for eight days. That's what's going to happen here. Now, when the mountains separated, remember earlier on, and they will come back together again, imagine what happened at the Sea of Reeds. Again, the water spread, but it didn't say spread. It eventually collapsed on itself. So if you can have water spread and collapse on itself, Imagine what happens when the land spreads and collapses back on itself. He goes on to say, but if a family of Egypt that does not go up, in other words, there's some families that are going to say, I don't need to go up because I'm going to have water anyway. Because remember, Sukkot is a festival about water. Egypt wasn't taken care of by rain. Egypt was taken care of by flood. And so there may be those that are like the family of Egypt or areas where there are desert. Desert areas don't depend on water the way we do. They aren't dependent upon the rain. They're dependent upon artesians, wells, whatever else they can find. 
So as they go through this, they don't go up. There will be no water for them. The same plague will come to pass, which Hashem will strike the nations that do not go up to celebrate the festival of Sukkot. This will be the punishment of the Egyptians and the punishment of the nations that will not go up to celebrate the festival of Sukkot. Drought. How many years can you afford to go without water? I remember Vendel Jones used to talk about the fact that, you know, sometimes people think I'm so ordinary that I'll never have another drop to drink. He says, well, I don't mind that. He says, as long as I'm next to a good neighbor who has water so that I can somehow funnel into his water supply and keep it for myself. But that won't happen in these days. Now it says, on that day will be written on the horse's bells. So in other words, at the conclusion of the battles or war, this third war, at that conclusion, holy unto Hashem and the pots of the temple of Hashem will be as numerous as the bulls before the altar. Why do you need all kinds of pots? All kinds of people are going to come up. What's going to happen when they do come up? And it will happen that every pot in Jerusalem and in Judea will be holy unto Hashem, the legion. All those who sacrifice will come and take from them and cook in them. Sacrifice. We think that sacrifices will end because there's no need for sacrifices anymore. Jesus did it all. That's not true. There will be peace offerings that will be brought, thanksgiving offerings that will be brought. And at those offerings, you're going to need to deal with the ashes of all of the animals that have been slain, the leftovers, whatever you want to call it. And that will be the end of it. So there's going to be a great amount of things going on. But remember, in a peace offering or a thanksgiving offering, remember that the meat that's on the altar is taken from the altar and part of it is eaten by the person who brought it and the levy who did the sacrificing or the Cohen who did the sacrificing and together they'll sit down to eat. And what will they do when they sit down to eat? They talk Torah because you see, that's what you're supposed to do. When you sit down, mealtime is supposed to be about that. And he goes on to say, and finally, and there will be no longer be any merchants in the temple of Hashem, master of legions on that day. No profiting. No profiting will happen. Okay, so there's, there's a summary then of, of what's going to happen as it goes. But I want to go to the <clears throat> final part. Even after this whole thing is done, there will be works, if you would want to call them so, as the Christians do. Everyone will still have a work to do, a mitzvah. Now, that's besides the seven mitzvahs that the Gentiles are to handle. What's the new mitzvah? Sukkot. All that goes with Sukkot will become a mitzvah to everyone. Everyone will remember that day. So we will have a new 4th of July, and it will be called Sukkot. And that will be the time that we celebrate. Now, Rabbi Hirsch, when commenting on all of this happening, said all the efforts of the nations using their power and their to fight against the connections with God and his laws ends with the acknowledging God that he is king and he is king in Jerusalem. So we now have a city that is going to be totally rebuilt. If we take the dimensions that are given for us in Ezekiel chapter 45, verses 1 to 4, the temple grounds itself will be five miles square. The city of Jerusalem will not be surrounding the temple. It will be to the south of the temple. And it will occupy an area 20 miles square. Those will be the dimensions of the city, because you see, the city is now going to have to be the innkeeper for all the nations and all the people coming up. Imagine the numbers of pots, the 
all of the necessary just for those days when we all arrive. Now, Rashi talks about something else that I hadn't thought about. And he mentions the fact there will not be any poor from this day forward. Poverty will be eliminated. Now, Jewish sources discuss the question of the actual occurrence of this final war. Maimonides established that there is a inherent unclarity regarding the particulars of the war of Gog and Magog. Because you can see there's, what I read to you does not complete what 12 and 13 will add to the story. So it's all related to us by the descriptions of the prophets. Now, all these are similar, but they have, again, when they were written, there were no vowels. And so there is room for understanding and misunderstanding. I want to get to that point when we get into Bereshit, how things, words have multiple ideas that can go with them. Now, in the, in the idea of Mishnah Torah Hilakot, it says that a bad prophecy does not necessarily have to happen. It doesn't necessarily have to be fulfilled. In fact, there was a story about Rabbi Shmuel Bornstein. And this was back in the 1916. He was giving a message. And the message was copied down. And so I want to read you the message. We have it by tradition from our holy teachers that as of this time, we have been exempted from the wars of Gog and Magog. Now, remember, he did not believe World War I was the first of the battles of Gog and Magog. It was not until Rabbi Kagan who said that this was going to be the case. So understand what he's saying. The ingathering of the exiles, Jewish people will dwell peacefully on their land forever. When is the exile, when is the Aliyah going to be complete? I think it's Isaiah 45 tells us that when the last Jew comes in, that will be the end of the Aliyah. Now for just as in Egypt, the harshness of the enslavement added up to the amount foretold by God of 400 years. Now allowing the Exodus to take place after just only 210 years. So in other words, Abraham's told that this whole thing is gonna last 400 years. The rabbi says, but it only lasted 210 years. Does that mean that he is shortened again these days at the end? That is what he's trying to question. So it is with this exile. Although the other way around, the length of time in this exile has added up to the harshness of enslavement, the length of the exile has made up for many evils and troubles. So exile is a way of dealing with the sins of the people. For this reason, because of the length of time in the exile has made it for, up for it, the birth pangs of the Mashiach coming will not be so difficult or unbearable. You ladies have experienced birth, recognize the fact that it might be a little painful. Well, the pain will be less because this not, is not going to happen, according to the rabbi. One should not wonder how it could be that something written explicitly in scriptures will change. For with regard to Egypt, it was clearly stated in the verse that, that, that it would be for 400 years. And yet the harshness of the enslavement made, it for, made up for it. In 190 years, we're taken off. So in the same concept regarding the wars of Gog and Magog, they will be shortened. Makes sense. But it's, it's worthy of listening to Rabbi Kagan and what he had to say. Now, both of them lived through World War I. Both of them experienced that. Rabbi Kagan was in the Ukraine. At the same point in time, Rabbi uh, Borstein was in Poland. So both had an experience with it. Rabbi Kagan goes on to say that the, that the first war was the first war was Ezekiel 38. The second war was Ezekiel 39. And that about 70 years later will be the third war of Gog and Magog. Well, at this point in time, we're past 70. Does that mean it's not going to happen? 
That's the question that's been left. The writers believe that the phase that the yeah that this phase of history will last no more than six thousand years. We're in the year five thousand seven hundred eighty-three. Six thousand minus fifty-seven eighty-three leaves us with two hundred seventeen years. So we either have two hundred seventeen years left, or God can come early. Rabbi Pincus Winston taught many years ago, and I still have kept it in my heart. He said, yes, the battle was 210 years, but that will be taken off the end of time. So technically, if he is correct, we have only seven more years. Something to think about. No good answer. So anyway, this is the end of my understanding of Zechariah chapter 14. And so any questions?